Paris, May 2002. Bertrand was late, as usual. I tried not to mind, but I did. Zoe lolled back against the wall, bored. She looked so much like her father, it sometimes made me smile, but not today. I glanced up at the ancient, tall building, Mamet's place, Bertrand's grandmother's old apartment, and we were going to live there. We were going to leave the Boulevard de Montparnasse, its noisy traffic, incessant ambulances due to three neighboring hospitals, its cafes and restaurants for this quiet, narrow street on the right bank of the Seine. The Marais was not an arrondissement I was familiar with, although I did admire its ancient, crumbling beauty. Was I happy about the move? I wasn't sure. Bertrand hadn't really asked my advice. We hadn't discussed it much at all, in fact. With his usual gusto, he had gone ahead with the whole affair. Without me. There he is, said Zoe. Only half an hour late. We watched Bertrand saunter up the street with his particular sensual strut. Slim, dark, oozing sex appeal. The archetypal Frenchman. He was on the phone, as usual. Trailing behind him was his business associate, the bearded and pink-faced Antoine. Their offices were on the Rue de l'Arcade, just behind the Madeleine. Bertrand had been part of an architectural firm for a long time, since before our marriage, but he had started out on his own with Antoine five years ago. Bertrand waved to us, then pointed to the phone, lowering his eyebrows and scowling. Like he can't get that person off the phone, scoffed Zoe. Sure. Zoe was only 11, but it sometimes felt like she was already a teenager. First, her height, which dwarfed all her girlfriends, as well as her feet, she would add grimly, and then a precocious lucidity that often made me catch my breath. There was something adult about her solemn, hazel gaze, the reflective way she lifted her chin. She had always been like that, even as a little child, calm, mature, sometimes too mature for her age. Antoine came to greet us while Bertrand went on with his conversation, just about loud enough for the entire street to hear, waving his hands in the air, making more faces, turning around from time to time to make sure we were hanging on to every word. A problem with another architect, explained Antoine with a discreet smile. A rival? asked Zoe. Yes, a rival, replied Antoine. Zoe sighed. Which means we could be here all day, she said. I had an idea. Antoine, do you by any chance have the key to Madame Tezac's apartment? I do have it, Julia, he said, beaming. Antoine always spoke English to my French. I suppose he did it to be friendly, but it secretly annoyed me. I felt like my French still wasn't any good after living here all these years. Antoine flourished the key. We decided to go up, the three of us. Zoe punched out the digicode at the door with deft fingers. We walked through the leafy, cool courtyard to the elevator. I hate that elevator, said Zoe. Papa should do something about it. Honey, he's only redoing your great-grandmother's place, I pointed out. Not the whole building. Well, he should, she said. As we waited for the elevator, my mobile phone chirped out the Darth Vader theme. I peered at the number flashing on my screen. It was Joshua, my boss. I answered, yep. Joshua was to the point, as usual. Need you back by three. Closing July issues, over and out. Gee whiz, I said pertly. I heard a chuckle on the other end of the line before he hung up. Joshua always seemed to like it when I said gee whiz. Maybe it reminded him of his youth. Antoine seemed amused by my old-fashioned Americanisms. I imagined him hoarding them up, then trying them out with his French accent. The elevator was one of those inimitable Parisian contraptions with a diminutive cabin, hand-maneuvered iron screen, and double wooden doors that inevitably swung in your face. 
squashed between Zoe and Antoine, a trifle heavy-handed with his vetiver scent, I caught a glimpse of my face in the mirror as we glided up. I looked as eroded as the groaning lift. What had happened to the fresh-faced Belle from Boston, Mass? The woman who stared back at me was at that dreaded age between forty-five and fifty, that no-man's land of sag, oncoming wrinkle, and stealthy approach of menopause. I hate this elevator, too, I said grimly. Zoe grinned and pinched my cheek. Mom, even Gwyneth Paltrow would look like hell in that mirror. I had to smile. That was such a Zoe-like remark.